Um, good morning to those watching and listening. Welcome to this webinar uh, organised by Bickle, and thanks to Ivano Alonia, who's uh, behind the organisation of it. The title of the webinar is The Climate Case Against Total in France, Lessons Learned and Future Prospects. Um, it's being recorded. Uh, I hope that's OK with all of you. Uh, it will be available on the Bickle website once it's been tidied up a little bit. So I'll begin by introducing uh, myself and then our three uh, very eminent speakers. My name is Stephen Tromans. I'm a British barrister, Queen's Counsel. I began my career in teaching law, a lecturer at Cambridge University. But since 1990, I've worked as a uh, professional uh, lawyer in the environmental and energy field, um, had involvement in a number of cases involving uh, climate, climate change, uh, and I'm also a visiting professor at the Energy Law Institute at Queen Mary University in London. Um, the, the three speakers we have, uh, I'll introduce them in order of appearance, and I'll just run briefly through the programme that we have for you this morning. Uh, Professor Dr. Yap Speer. Uh, Yap is extraordinary professor of global challenges at the University of Stellenbosch, and of particular relevance to our discussion this morning is a former Advocate General of the Dutch Supreme Court, so eminently well qualified to take us through this, this subject. The second speaker will be Professor Mathilde uh, Boutonnet. She's a private law professor at Aix Marseille University in France, uh, teaching environmental law, directing the master's degree on environmental law, and also a visiting research fellow at, at Bickle. So very good she's with us this morning. And our last speaker will be um, Joanna Setzer, who's assistant professor in climate governance and regulation at the London School of Economics. So by way of just a brief introduction, very briefly, and then uh, just explaining the programme. Uh, I think as a, a UK environmental lawyer, uh, like many others, I'm rather envious of the inventiveness which seems to be displayed by courts in other countries uh, and look with a certain degree of awe at what's been going on in The, uh, in the Hague uh, and what may be going on in, in Paris uh, with, with Total. I think in, in the UK, our focus has tended to be uh, not so much on private law actions against uh, companies, uh, but on um, really public or judicial review actions uh, against uh, government and local authorities. Uh, largely, it has to be said, unsuccessful. I think partly because the substantive law is not very conducive in the UK to such claims, but also importantly, as we will see, I think because of relief, uh, the courts are very reluctant seems to me to grant meaningful uh, relief in uh, relation to um, the um, uh, such claims. And I think there may be a slight issue with uh, sound uh, quality. We're getting a few questions on that. Uh, and I'm told that the technician uh, at Bickle is trying to uh, fix and improve that. So I hope very much that will that will improve as we go as we go on. Um, so um, the first speaker, I'll hand over to him in a moment, will be um, Yap. We're not beginning with the Total case, we're actually beginning with the decision in, in the Shell case in the District Court of The Hague. The reason for that is uh, it, it's very important, I think, to, to understand that case as a foundation for the, the Total case and other cases which follow. So Yap is going to explain that uh, to us. Um, uh, Matilde is then going to talk about the Total case, uh, the foundations of that case in, the very, in terms of the various duties of vigilance, duty of care, the Ecological Compensation Act, and uh, that's against the background of the Paris judge involved in the case has now just recognised competence to, to hear the case. Uh, and finally, uh, from Joanna, we're going to hear a, a roundup, if you like, of important cases against uh, carbon uh, major companies, uh, which are um, happening not only now within the US, but also proliferating outside of the US. Each speaker is going to have about 15 minutes. Uh, that means I hope we will finish before, a little before midday, 
uh, and we can then devote half an hour at the end to questions and discussion. Um, could I ask if you have a question, please, to use the um, uh, use the uh, chat, uh, sorry, the Q&A function, and um, then we'll um, see uh, what comes up by way of, of questions. Um, so I'm going to hand over to, uh, yeah, I'm going to drop off and come back again, just in case there was a problem with my microphone uh, connection. Um, so I'll see you again in a, in a moment, but I'll hand over to you. Uh, yeah, delighted you're with us. Look forward to hearing what you have to say now on the, the, the um, Dutch case involving Shell. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Stephen. Good morning. NGO, Milieu Defensie and others sought injunctive relief that Shell uh, must reduce its scope one to three G greenhouse gas emissions of all companies belonging to the Shell Group by at least 45% in 2030 compared to 2019. The District Court of The Hague issued a slightly softened relief. Shell has to reduce its scope one emissions as sought. It has a significant best efforts obligation to reduce its scope two and three emissions of the entire group of companies um, by at least 45% in 2030 to compare to 20, 2019. The final part of the judgment does not refer to significant best efforts, but it follows from the judgment read in its entirety this was meant. Unfortunately, the judgment does not explain what is meant by significant best efforts. The lengthy judgment is based on the standard of care emanating from the key provision of Dutch tort law, the blanket norm. According to the court, the standard of care in this case is determined by the impact of climate change on Dutch residents. The court emphasizes that its interpretation of the standard of care is influenced by the following factors. I stick to the main issues. The policy setting position of the parent company, the right to life and the right to respect private and family life of Dutch citizens. The UN guiding principles, the parent company's influence of the CO2 emissions of the Shell Group and its business relations. What is <coughs> need, needed to prevent dangerous climate change, possible reduction pathways, the effectiveness of the reduction obligation, the responsibility of, sta of uh, states and society, and the proportionality of the reduction obligation formulated by the court. The judgment, and Shell has appealed in the meantime, is courageous and groundbreaking. To me, the scope one obligation is convincing. The same goes by and large for the scope two obligation, basically linked to electricity bought by Shell. The scope three obligation is far less convincing, at least to me. The court does not really explain why it has formulated such a far reaching obligation. It does not necessarily mean that the judgment is mistaken. The blanket norm of Dutch tort law, the open and vague norms of soft law and the urgency of the problem allow for the court interpretation. I don't dare to speculate uh, about the prospects of the appeal. Seeing the still increasing global emissions and the increasingly alarming IPCC reports, I would be very surprised if the scope one and two part will be reversed. The IPCC reports could stimulate the Court of Appeal 
to upheld also the scope three obligation. Depending on the shortage of fossil fuels due to the war in the Ukraine and God forbid, other countries uh, may be a sound reason for the Court of Appeal to reverse the scope three part of the judgment. So far, the debate predominantly focuses on the question whether the appeal stands a chance of success. Let me explain why. I don't th think that that is the right question. First, the increasingly alarming IPCC reports. The ever more and more serious natural catastrophes around the globe at the stage global temperature has increased by just slightly more than one degree C. Global emissions are still rising. The ill-considered and ill-informed debate about 2050. In any realistic scenario, we don't have 30 more years. Hence, it is irresponsible to bet on net zero by 2050. But even net zero by 2050, coupled with 1.5 C, is unrealistic. Seeing the vague trajectories offered by many states and enterprises, the pledges made by China, net zero by 2060, India, net zero by 2070, uh, the political situation in the US and Brazil and many other countries, and last but not least, it would be against the odds that politicians are going to agree on sufficient and enforceable legal instruments that may happen at some stage it will come too late. Hence, it should not come as a surprise that NGOs and de developing countries feel an urgent need to take action. We may or may not appreciate every single case they submit to courts. But what else can they do? I don't deny that far-reaching judgments may be unfair to specific defendants, but opinions diverge about the meaning of unfair. Developing countries and people living in those countries bereft of any luxury, quite often even basic amenities of life, don't care about less luxury in our part of the world. And the same may go for courts in those countries. As a matter of fact, key players don't show the slightest interest to discern their legal obligations. That goes for states, for enterprises, investors, and auditors. And that unavoidably means they can't comply with their obligations, and they don't want to comply either. An international group of experts has taken up, up the gauntlet. We've drafted principles on climate obligation of enterprises. The former principles, the principles are endorsed by 90 eminent lawyers. Top experts kindly wrote supportive prefaces. The real world doesn't show any interest. Although I still believe that our principles are more balanced than most judgments, my goal is not to promote them. My point is we must make the discussion much more concrete. If those at the wheel stick to ignorance or are leaning backwards, uh, the sword of the law must bring them to their senses. With notable exceptions, legal debate and, to the extent I can judge, legal opinions also hinge about all, upon similar shortcomings, misunderstandings, and lack of expertise. The 2050 paradigm, the unwillingness to enter into meaningful discussions about obligations of key players, the lack of understanding how the law works, and to focus on courts of the country where their clients are based. And that 
really is a problem. Greenhouse gas emissions in, say, the UK have a global impact. Hence, it is likely that English enterprises can be sued before multiple courts. Some courts may not be willing to come on board. Others most definitely will. And that means that even the victory of a defendant in the UK is no guarantee whatsoever that the same will happen around the globe. I'm not suggesting that foreign courts should be willing to adjudicate scope three emissions of a group of companies not based in the relevant country. Strikingly, even after it had moved its head office to the UK, it, its seat was already in the UK, Shell did not challenge that the full case can be decided by a Dutch court. By the way, not the only mistake they have made. Because enterprises can be sued before multiple courts, they would be best served to explore global obligations. Not doing so may come at a high price. Enterprises may and likely will be treated on unexpectedly far-reaching judgments, requiring swift and costly measures, potentially to remedy shortcomings in the past. The only questions are how far-reaching and which courts are going to grant far-reaching relief. Enterprises may face liability, also of directors and officers, if it turns out that they did not comply with their obligations to be shaped by courts. Personally, I don't think that far-reaching liability is the answer. We must keep the floodgates shut. But I also have to admit that it is very unbalanced to say to poor countries and people living in poor countries, well, tough luck, we have caused the problem, you have to incur the losses. Uh, we have to do something, and it will be extremely difficult to strike the right balance. And needless to say, there is no discussion about it either. Criticasters will answer, well, but these are political issues. My answer is yes, these are political issues, but please bear in mind, politicians don't do enough, if anything at all. And we know that. So we can't wait for political action. Hence, this argument should be uh, rejected by courts, but not all courts will reject it. Others will, as we have seen already. Others will argue all we have to do is to comply with the Paris Agreement. That means to them, we must keep global warming at 2C and net zero emissions by 2050. 2050 is not in the Paris Agreement. Two degrees C is not in the Paris Agreement. And the Paris Agreement does not contain obligations of enterprises. But even if that were different, when the planet is in flames and the fortunes of nature and future generations are in peril, one can't avoid to sacrifice legal doctrine for the common good. Let me, summary, let me summarize my sobering conclusions. KV, <coughs> KNM, as you may pronounce it in England, beware of the dog. As long as society basically opts for a sit and wait position, the real dogs are climate change and our lethargy. Not litigation, even not if it ends up in overly bold judgments. The deadlock must be overcome, and that requires swift and bold action. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, yeah, thank you very much indeed. Um, I hope maybe people can hear me a little bit better uh, having 
come come out and logged in again you can that's that's good uh, thanks for keeping uh, to time me up that huge amount of thought provoking material in there we, we're going to take questions at the end so i hope you'll put up some questions in the q and a session but i'm going to immediately now really hand over to uh, uh, mathilde who is going to talk about the the total litigation in france following on from what uh, Iap had to say uh, so mathilde over to you Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Is it okay? Yeah, please. Can I speak now? Thank you, and thank you for, for this invitation, Ivano. It's a pleasure to be, to be uh, with, uh, with you. Uh, maybe to start, it's uh, important to know that uh, in France, uh, for, for, have, uh, for having a, a better, oh, sorry, just here, no. Yes. Um, it is important to, for starting to know that in France, we have two kinds of judges. One judge has competence for judging the acts of the state and the administration, while another judge has competence for judging the private persons, such as individuals or companies. And concerning climate case litigation, Two judgments ruled by the administrative judge in 2021 have already condemned the French state. One is called the Grand Saint case, and the other is known under the name of the case of the century. But now, uh, like for the other climate litigations over the world, some individual cities, NGOs turn to the judiciary judge to request the condemnation of total energy company for its contribution to the climate change. Indeed, according to the carbon major reports, well known, Total, which is a large energy company that manufactures all biofuels, gas, and electricity, is also one of the 20 companies contributing the most to the global warming worldwide. The goal of the claimants is then to force Total to modify its behavior and stop to emit greenhouse gases. Today, more precisely, there are two kinds of litigation against Total. One is based on consumer law arguments and is very recent. The lawsuit was filed last month. Plaintiffs allege that the advertising campaign of Total misleads French consumers. Total can't pretend to get the target of net zero, net zero emissions by 2050, to be a major player in the energy transition, and to say that the company promotes environmental virtues. The other case is more famous and concerns more generally the liability law, or maybe it is a white expression, the compliance law also. On January 2020, 13 cities and four NGOs, notably the famous Notre Affaire à tous, filed a request before the judge of Nanterre. Nanterre is a city where the parent company is domiciliated. I will focus now on this little case because the Tribunal of Paris has very recently been designated competent to judge. But what are the legal basis of this total case? There are three, three legal bases. First legal basis, the duty of vigilance in the commercial code. On March 2017, the French legislature created a new specific law, which is called duty of vigilance. Under this act, since January 2018, certain corporations, most important corporations, are required to draw up and effectively implement a vigilance plan. More precisely, this plan must be published by the company. It must produce reasonable vigilance measures suitable to prevent serious damage, such as ecological damage resulting for the for, from the activities of the company, those of the companies it controls and the activities of some of their 
subcontractors or suppliers as well. The, the disclosures of the plan is very important because it allows shareholders and stakeholders to monitor the company's compliance with the law and if a case of non-compliance is detected, for instance, bring the company before a judge. Indeed, the law of the duty of vigilance previews an enforcement mechanism. The French Commercial Code previews that, and I quote, when a company that has been formally notified to comply with the duty of vigilance does not comply within three months of receiving the formal notice, the relevant court may, at the request of any person with legal standing, order such company to perform these obligations. That's why in total case, thinking that total doesn't respect the law, the plaintiffs ask total to comply with the legal duty of vigilance and for that specifically to reduce its oil and gas productions in order to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees, which is the objective of course of the Paris Agreement. The second legal basis is the violation of the well-known duty of care raising from uh, the environmental constitutional charter and the civil code. About charter for the environment which has a constitutional value in France, we must indeed remind that it contains an article two that provides, and I quote, everyone has the duty to participate in preserving, I'm sorry, there is a problem of sound. Uh, mute your mic. I have to so, cut my yeah. sound? Yeah. Sorry, just a moment. Please respond. Yes. To participate in preserving the and relying on the French environmental constitutional provisions, the French Constitutional Council decided in 2011 that every person is under an obligation to exercise care that no damage to the environment results from his actions. And above all, the duty of care is recognized in the civil code, in the part related to the liability laws, and since 1804, when the civil code was created, uh, there is an article which states any human, it's a very old fashioned word, any human action um, which causes. Mathilde, I'm sorry to interrupt, but the sound is, is very, uh, very poor. I think we're not catching it. I don't know if we can take a moment just to try and try and fix that, please. Better to switch to the yeah, uh, version of the Do you think? Stefan, can you hear me now? Is it better? No, okay, that's fine. I'll just forget that. So, can you hear? Um, no, it's it's so falling in the room. Okay, let's keep like this. Because I've not been in the the system. Okay, please. What do you think now? Yeah, can yeah. you hear me? Is it okay? Great. So I can continue. Uh, I was speaking about the duty of care, which is recognized in the civil code. And uh, so the civil code uh, uh, said 
um, mm. says any human action which causes harm to another creates an obligation in the person by whose fault it occurred to make reparation for it. This provision is very flexible and it is possible to think that today on this ground, a responsible oil company has to respect the duty of care by adopting a behavior adequate for combating the climate change, for instance, by reducing the greenhouse gas created by its activities. Finally, the third legal basis of the total case is the act of the compensation of ecological damage, which is also located in the civil code. In 2016, the French legislator created a regime of compensation for ecological damage. And the civil code prevails also a very interesting provision which imposed to the polluter not only to repair the damage caused to nature, but also to prevent it. In this way, the judge may prescribe reasonable steps to prevent or stop the ecological damage. This former provision is very important because it could allow to force Total to complain with the law and finally to adopt policies more adequate for combating the climate change. At this stage, we can make three comments. First comment, the three legal bases are invoked in a preventive or compliance perspective. Like the many American cases or the Shell case in the Netherlands, the goal is not to obtain damages, but to request some injunction for forcing Total to adopt more important measures for combating the climate change. Second comment, like Shell case, but also Uganda case in the Netherlands, or more, more recently, the climate attack case in Belgium, one of the main legal basis of the action is the duty of care deducted also, like the other case from constitutional provisions or directly from the old civil code provisions. Third comment, unlike, unlike all the other climate case litigation, for the first time, two original legal bases are invoked. The system of prevention of ecological damage, it is a legal provision, a damage caused to the nature itself and not to the individuals. And above all, the obligation to establish and implement a plan of vigilance. About this one, certainly in many countries, the duty of vigilance finds its sources in various instruments which belong to the corporate social responsibility, such as the OECD guidelines. But these instruments remain soft law and their violation is not easily punishable. On the contrary, because in France, the duty of vigilance belongs now to hard law, it will be interesting to discover how a judge will manage with it and therefore to evaluate it, to evaluate the efficiency of this system. To conclude, the trial against Total is expected for several reasons that we can fully understand. It will be a big occasion to confirm the role of the duty of care and the civil code in this combat. And of course also um, to, to give an appreciation to evaluate the efficiency of the duty of vigilance organized by the ad law. Um, I think that I will stop here and we could maybe discuss about the chances, the chances of success of the total climate case after doing the debate. Thank you. Uh, Mathilde, thanks very much. I'm sorry you had to contend with your microphone, um, but anyway, what, what, what you said we, we heard and was uh, was very clear. And we're, we're really pretty much on time, which is very good. So I will hand over to uh, Joanna now to, to conclude our presentations, then we'll move into questions. We've had a few coming in. 
uh, and I'll be making a note of them. So we'll, we'll deal with those uh, at uh, midday or thereabouts. So Joanna, thank you. Joanna, I think you're muted at the moment. No, but then if I am, you have to mute yourself there. Yeah, okay. What about now? Are we better? We're navigating the complex world of hybrid. And wow. thanks for bearing with us. You see, at least the three of us are in the room and we can hear each other very well, but that doesn't mean that um, all, all, all others far can. So, well, thank you for inviting me, uh, Ivano, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to be part of this panel. What I want is to put these two cases that we heard from Ya and from Mathilde, so the Shell and the Total case in, in a bigger picture of climate litigation. I have a few slides, not too many, but uh, and most with graphs. So I think it's justified to share them. Um, and some are new graphs that I think are quite interesting. So let me share my screen here with you and start talking to you about the this big picture. Uh, let's see if this is working all right. Yeah, are we good? Yes, oh, okay. Good. So um, as I said, the, what I want to do in my 15 minutes is to, to give a bigger picture. Bigger picture of what? So what I want to do in this presentation is first to situate the Total and the Shell case in the bigger picture of climate litigation against carbon majors and against corporations in general. And then uh, in the bigger picture of a subset of the cases, which are the rights-based climate litigation. The content uh, of this presentation uh, draws from different publications, and I'm already mentioning them here, so I don't have to keep citing them along the way. The first is the, um, in terms of the general trends in climate litigation, is our work particularly the Global Trends Report. And if you don't mind, Ivano, I want to advertise our event to launch the new 2022 report tomorrow. Uh, in case uh, those of you listening are in London, it would be wonderful to see you in person and we'll have drinks and a cocktail after. Uh, those who can't, uh, you can also join online as it will be hybrid and hopefully without uh, too many glitches. So this is, um, I'm going to use some of the really new uh, numbers and trends that no one has seen already today here. Um, so leaking that to you. Um, and then on the right space climate litigation, this is a paper that was published a few months ago this year in 2022. Annalisa Savarezi and I did this mapping of rights based climate litigation, which is uh, now open access. So uh, also something that you can, uh, I can refer you to if you're interested. Very well. So let me begin with the general climate litigation against the fossil fuel industry and other corporates. The two cases that we heard presented, the Shell case and the Total case, of course, have that in common. These are two major fossil fuel oil companies that are also so-called carbon majors. The term carbon majors is a term that has been coined by uh, Rick Heedy in the study on the accountability of carbon majors, the uh, major oil and gas companies um, in the world. So if we think about this body of cases that have been filed against the, fossil, the carbon majors, the fossil fuel industry, it's interesting to see in this graph that you see the bar chart, the blue and red, uh, what is happening in the world. So this is a growing trend still. Um, uh, of course, in 2022, we, we stop in May, but you can see um, uh, that the bar is already halfway. And uh, not only is a growing phenomenon, but also one that started, you can see uh, with the, um, the colors very much in the US, and now it's very much a non-US. And the two cases that we saw, Shell in the Netherlands, Total in France, uh, are, are good examples of how now the most interesting, exciting novel cases are cases that are not being brought in the US. So you see uh, the graph shows the increase in number of cases. It also shows 
how it's becoming more significant outside of the US, uh, especially in 2021 and now in 2022. What is also interesting, and, and, and this is again a graph of our new report that we're publishing tomorrow, is that while carbon majors are still, of course, uh, uh, an obvious target of climate litigation, we are seeing an increase in diversity of sectors against uh, who these cases have been filed. So um, if, if you look at this um, graph on the side, you can see that in the calendar year of 2021, while 16 of the 38 cases against corporates uh, were filed against fossil fuel companies, more than half were filed against defendants in other sectors. And here we have food and agriculture, we have transport and plastics, as well as finance as being uh, sectors targeted in multiple cases. So I, I find these, uh, these two graphs and, and figures really very uh, interesting and they illustrate how, uh, yes, litigation against carbon majors is still central, but also is diversifying and is diversifying uh, also around the world. So these two um, are uh, situating Shell and, and, and Total in the big, big picture of climate litigation. And now I want to narrow down to what these two cases also have in common, which is that they are two types of climate litigation uh, that is bright based as, as it has already been mentioned. So what, what do we see in terms of this uh, rights based climate litigation? Well, first of all, it's, uh, it's not it's something that has been happening for so long. It started basically in 2015 uh, with the first cases against governments, particularly the Ligari case. Uh, so the Ligari case made history by accepting arguments that the government failures uh, to address climate change violated human rights, the petitioner's rights in this case, uh, Ashkar Ligari. So this was 2015. In 2015, also, we have the first decision in the Ogenda case, and, and in 2018, Ogenda case becomes a rights-based case. And from then on, uh, this is really, it really picks up. I'll show you in the next graph. Uh, in 2018, Jackie Peel and Harry Ozowski published that paper saying that they were observing a rights turn in climate litigation. Uh, and what is interesting, and we do this in the paper with Annalisa Savarezi, is that since 2018, uh, until so between 2018 and 2021, over two thirds of the rights-based cases that we know of today were filed and now even more. So really when they said there was a rights turn, it was just the beginning of that turn. And, and, and now that turn really materialized. Um, how we define these rights-based, uh, it's climate litigation is very similar to how we define climate litigation. So the lawsuits that raise questions of law or fact regarding climate change, science, mitigation, adaptation, but then uh, we include that rely in whole or in part in human rights. What I want to do in the next uh, slide is to uh, situate therefore the, the Shell and, and the Total case within this subset of rights-based cases. And, um, and to show you uh, uh, how within this uh, trend, they are particularly interesting and important. Um, so the, the way we identify all these cases and do this analysis, you, you probably know, is by um, looking at our databases of climate litigation cases. And these are maintained by the Sabin Center, by us at uh, Grantham. But for this particular piece, we also looked at the business and human rights uh, database for the so-called just transition cases, which I'm not going to mention today. And, and then we classify them according to the grounds in which the cases are brought, who is bringing against who. So, you know, these complicated Excel sheets that we have. Anyway, this is just a note on the methodology, but what we find uh, about the rights-based climate litigation is also quite interesting because whereas climate litigation in general has been evolving slowly, gradually, consistently since uh, the really the beginning of the 2000s, the human rights-based litigation is more recent and, and, and picked from, as I said, 2015, particularly since 2018. 
so post Paris Agreement, post the Gary and, and Urgenta. The geography of these cases, especially compared to general trends, I, I also find quite interesting. So climate litigation in general, still very concentrated in the US, few uh, then second Australia, Europe, the UK with a number of cases, but South, uh, Af the South, so uh, the African continent, Latin America, Asia respond for a very small number of cases comparatively. Compare that with the trends in rights-based litigation and you see a much more uniform graph where uh, Af the African continent and Latin America and, and international litigation figure much more prominently. And again, the Total and the Shell case are uh, good examples of, of that. So when we are thinking about rights-based litigation, the most obvious uh, type of case are the cases that are brought against states and public authorities. Well, this is very much to be expected because in human rights law, states are the primary duty bearers. With that in mind, we look at the whole uh, over 100 cases of rights-based climate litigation and we create this typology of what litigation against the state that is grounded on human rights looks like and the different types. We separate them by uh, substantive and procedural and then other types. Um, and what I think it's relevant for this discussion today is that whereas that is the most obvious type of litigation and the largest number of cases have been um, of uh, here we have 90 something cases against the state that precedents in this type of rights-based litigation against the state are informing rights-based lit climate litigation against corporates. And where we saw this most clearly was in how the Urgenda decision was then transferred, of course, <laughs> adapted uh, and, and, and significantly different in many, uh, to, to a large extent, but really uh, in, in, in very important uh, aspects transferred to the shell case in that the duty of care that the that the courts in the Netherlands understood the state had to avoid climate change as a way to protect human rights not to violate human rights was then extrapolated expanded and applied to a corporate so this is where uh, in, in many ways I think litigation and, and precedents that have been obtained in litigation against states is also relevant and therefore those following litigation, even if mostly interested in the corporate side, also need to pay attention at what's happening in the, in the government side. And here we get uh, uh, this second typology, if, if, if you look here at the screen, we do a similar type of typology of rights-based litigation against corporates and for that we identified 16 cases that were rights-based and uh, uh, filed against corporate actors, among which the Shell and the Total cases as the substantive um, type of case where we're seeking uh, reduction of emissions. What is, uh, again, important here is that this is a small but uh, increasingly uh, important number of cases that have, uh, that use rights-based to corporates. And this is quite novel and unique and still an area that is being explored. It becomes therefore very groundbreaking when you have uh, a decision such as the Shell decision or uh, also um, a finding such as the finding of the Human Rights Commission in the Philippines that could have potentially quite revolutionary impacts. Um, I, I don't want to go into the details uh, and I don't have time, especially also because uh, Yap and Mathilde already spoke about the two cases, but here you can see how those two cases also fall into a larger spectrum of rights-based climate litigation against corporates. And, 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 and you have examples of other cases that dealt with substantive rights, but from uh, seeking a negative obligation or cases that dealt with procedural rights uh, of disclosure of access to justice and uh, public participation. 
So I want to finish, I know I have two minutes left, um, and I want to finish with this slide where I, I, I make the argument that it's, uh, we're seeing a fascinating uh, moment of use of litigation against this group of actors, corporates, and uh, particularly carbon majors, that we see how rights-based litigation has been uh, quite transformational and important in, in, in this picture. Um, and what I, I mean by mixed bag is that what these cases are doing is to bring a lot of different parts. Uh, here I have a bag of sweeties, so many types of sweeties together. So we have the business and human rights. We have hum um, the climate change uh, legislation and framework. And we have the many other areas of law, which my colleagues mentioned of civil law, commercial law, consumer law, um, and, and, and due diligence. So all of this is being brought together in, in some of these cases. And uh, therefore the Total and the Shell case, they should be view, viewed in the context of a systemic shift in approach to accountability for climate change. I think that these cases together with many other ongoing cases are expected to resonate beyond France and beyond the Netherlands and really contribute to a more robust climate action and accountability worldwide. So the, the use of human rights and remedies to address climate change is becoming more complex, particularly in the light of these developments of standards for human rights and due diligence. What I I can uh, see happening is that uh, even independent of what the outcomes of this, these cases will be, is that business uh, action and conduct is now understood within this idea that there is a due diligence and that they should seize or mitigate violations to human rights and within human rights with it, uh, also uh, to the climate. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm hoping to uh, be able to discuss with you in the q and uh, That's great. We stopped on sharing. So um, I've had a, a number of questions have, have come in. Um, some of them I think have had uh, responses already. I know uh, Yap has, has uh, been very good in, in answering uh, a couple online, but I'm going to try and answer as many as possible in, in our panel session so uh, everyone can, can hear. Um, what's being said, but just a couple of practical points. Um, one question was, can can the PowerPoint uh, of Joanna be made available? Yes, I'm sure. Hopefully, it can via the Bickle um, the Bickle website. Yes, uh, there's a nod there, and uh, I think also um, uh, Yap mentioned his uh, the uh, the climate uh, principles for enterprises. Uh, just to give a plug to that, you can easily find that on the the internet. Uh, climate principles for enterprises uh, slash org. And uh, it's all there. So it's, it's a very substantive document which you can you can download and you can uh, and you can read. So I commend that to you. It's very very easy to find. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on to some questions then, if if I may. And I think this is perhaps a question for all three of you. It's one of the first questions which came in, and it's really to do, I think, with the um, the possible uniqueness of the, the situations in in the Netherlands and in in France, where you have obviously the, the, the indirect application of human rights interpreting quite loose unwritten duties of care uh, in the Shell case. Uh, quite a unique situation to be able to rely on that one international human rights law in, in, a, in a civil claim and similarly of course the, the duty of vigilance uh, in, in, in France. So I think the question there is well how far are those really rather unique national circumstances which may prevent uh, this sort of litigation being replicated uh, elsewhere. Uh, there's no particular order, but I'll give each of the three of you a chance to, to um, respond to that if you wish. Uh, okay, anybody want, to anybody want to volunteer to unmute themselves? Yes, well, uh, if I may. Well, unique. Um, I quite strongly believe that the law has a lot in common around the globe. And it very much is what courts are after. If they are after a specific outcome, 
it can often be reached, not necessarily always, but it is quite possible. And in this respect, uh, they can, if they want, rely on very open norms. And if they are keen to reject the claim, that's also quite possible. Uh, like minimal causation, uh, political issue, and what have you. But that also is a jump to a preferred outcome. It is not a required outcome. Uh, so, well, of course, it is much easier if there is a more or less concrete building block. But if courts really want to grant victory to plaintiffs, it's mostly quite possible, as judgments around the globe illustrate. And I could mention many. Uh, and in fact, uh, Johanna also already referred to many of those judgments. It's possible, but not mandatory. Just uh, as the New York Times uh, put it years ago about the extremely conservative Justice Scalia. Psst, Justice Scalia, you are an activist too. Yes, that was right. Great. Uh, Mathilde, would you like to add anything to that? And Joanna then, please. You're muted, uh, Mathilde. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, just to add uh, one comment. Um, I think there is also a big um, common point between the Netherlands and the, the French uh, litigation is that we have the same civil code. Because we have to, to, to remind that in the Shell case, uh, also the duty of care um, comes from uh, the civil code. And historically, it is a Napoleon code. So that's why for us in France, the Shell case is also a type of model. We can imagine, we can guess what the judge could be, could rule, um, with this model of the Netherlands model with this civil code. We have the same duty of care, and maybe for proving the violation of the duty of care, a front judge could imitate the reasoning of uh, the, the Shell case for this reason. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, Joanna? Anything you'd like to add? Yeah, sorry, sorry, just yeah. here. Um, I cut. So, uh, yeah, I wanted to build on Mathilde's point on the civil law and common law. I, I think that's an interesting um, uh, way to understand what's happening. And at the same time, uh, this issue that where le legislation exists and what type of legislation exists. Thinking of the EU now having a discussion on uh, a directive on duty of care uh, and, and how this is going to be likely the case that we will have more legislation requiring that duty of care, that sorry, that due diligence. Um, this is where I find that um, we, we are uh, really need to understand the litigation within also what legislation, what national legislation exists and where also litigation exists in the absence of legislation trying to push for the recognition of what otherwise would be soft law. So uh, I think you have those two situations where on one type of case, the, the legislation is there. So the country has a national climate law, it has uh, therefore targets commitments, it has potentially like in France, a law on due diligence, it has a civil code, 
And what you can do is to show that the company or the government's action is not consistent, is not you know, uh, adequate compared to that existing body of law. And then you have situations where that legislation might not be there and you try to, to bring from soft law or from what in, in I think works in the Netherlands but wouldn't work in so many places where is that you have this open standard like, this is, I think, something that only work in a country where people are very reasonable, right? You have an open standard and you just hope that people will be reasonable and, and apply that, that standard uh, in a way that makes sense today and it will make sense in 10 years because you know, the, 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 the expectations and the rights and the needs evolve. So um, it, comparing these two uh, diff quite different, but in many ways similar cases uh, uh, from those perspectives, I think it's very enlightening. Uh, great, thank you very, thanks very much. I'll try and um, bring together a couple of other questions, um, but just to make one observation, I was rather struck by a, a sentence in, in Yap's uh, presentation um, about uh, essentially if, if those if those at the wheel stick to ignorance or leaning backwards the sword of the law has to bring them to their senses I, I think the problem is what about if it's those at the wheel who are actually making the law so if, if the national law that they make uh, reflects their unwillingness to, to to act then of course there has to be an appeal to some form of higher uh, law uh, and it seems to me that you know human rights is probably the most uh, promising uh, form of higher law that there could be uh, an appeal to in this in this context, and that really, I think, raises a couple of points that come out in the in the in the questions. Um, uh, what one is a question was raised about uh, jurisprudence within the European Court of Human Rights over uh, Articles Two and Eight of the European Convention and whether climate change risks uh, fall within those, those those rights. Is there a right to uh, life is there a right to uh, home and family life involved in climate change risks and linked with that a another question which is well what about the science on tipping points uh, we get to a tipping point where the risks become substantially exponentially almost uh, much much greater and how does that fit in so um so i think really uh, the, behind the question is well if the, how much of all this lit litigation is going to be dependent upon uh, general jurisprudence and how that develops in relation to human rights uh, law? Um, I don't know whether may maybe that's a good one for uh, Joanna to start with, but um, uh, any anyone else can if they wish. Well, I can start. Um, so I, I, I see this uh, ongoing um, cases before the EU court um, as part of what I was saying in how litigation against the state can then resonate beyond. Um, and, and beyond in this case would be across jurisdictions and also from the public to the private. So of course, all these cases, um, now there are four, four or five um, uh, that have uh, reached uh, that point and, and, and all of them have been filed against the state. So that's the, fir the first point. The second is that what these cases are trying to do is that whereas the, the EU court justice has already um, decided on hundreds of environmental cases, these are the first climate cases that are trying to apply, as you said, articles two and eight to this global problem. And, and this is where uh, it's become, uh, I think, very much uh, a priority for uh, the court and and as far as i can tell the, the court is taking the, the the these cases very seriously and 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 uh, seeing them as not isolated but as you know the first cases of potentially many that are going to then you know knock on the door and and, and find the court so the, the the decision will have to be one that takes into consideration that, that it's not one particular isolated case, although they are quite different uh, between them. So you know, some of the cases uh, are of this type of broader case, uh, you know, like similar to what we see in Urgenda of kind of make, 
uh, becoming more ambitious and some are more specific about one particular set of permits, for example, the Norwegian case, that is very much kind of uh, one sector, a set of permits and, and what you do about those. So there are um, these distinctions between the those cases that I feel that will have also to be taken into consideration. Do you address the kind of very big ambition cases in a way, and then perhaps the, the ones that are uh, specific to uh, you know, a, a group of activities uh, in a different way? That, that might also be something that we will see uh, happening uh, once these cases are decided. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh... Mathilde, uh, Jaap, would you like to uh, say anything further on, on that question? Well, yes. Perhaps the most important line of the case law of the European Court of Human Rights ever is that the law is a living instrument. And that's precisely what this uh, issue is about. Uh, there is no settled case law around the globe. But the mere fact that the law and human rights law is a living instrument means that it is possible to reach a specific outcome. And that is also what is happening in the Americas. Uh, look at the case law of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Courageous, groundbreaking, uh, and the recent report issued by the American Commission on Human Rights, same story. Uh, so, well, that actually I wanted to very few hopeful developments, I'm, I think. Uh, uh, Mathilde, are you going to risk your microphone and add anything, or is that? Uh, you need to just unmute, Sorry. I think, again. Uh... Yeah. Just to add a comment, and uh, I think it's very important to make the difference between the states, because, for instance, in France, we don't need really to 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 rely on uh, the European Convention, because we have already a big, a very important uh, charter, the, the Charter of Environment, the Environment Charter, which has a constitutional value. So, for instance, is in the famous case of uh, the century, the case of the century. Um, uh, the, the, the plaintiffs try and, and force um, the judge to, to rely on uh, this convention, but the administrative judge denied and refused and, and, and stays silent about this convention, because for him it was enough uh, to give a judgment concerning also and only uh, the, the Article 2 of the Environmental Charter. So maybe when there is um, a big constitutional ground, it is easier for the plaintiffs to be here, uh, listened to from the judge. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, the, there's also a, an issue, I think, a separate question now around um, remedies that I'd like to, to, to pick up on it. Uh, that came out quite strongly from uh, Yap's uh, um, presentation. Um, and in principle, uh, the remedies are uh, an injunction to stop doing something, uh, an order to do something. Um, that may be quite problematic um, unless there is a very clear goal to be, be achieved uh, or damages uh, for harm caused. And the question is, well, um, how, how, do the, how do those remedies relate to each other? Are the courts more likely to give relief if one remedy is sought than another? Uh, are some remedies more suitable than others for dealing with particular aspects of, of, um, of climate change? It is critical because at the end of the day, uh, unless there is an effective remedy, uh, there's frankly no point in bringing the, bringing the case. So um, I'd be interested to hear uh, from you from you all again uh, again on that. Maybe, uh, Mathilde, would you, like to, would you like to start? I mean, if the, if the, um, if the total case uh, is is uh, successful in its outcome. Um, what in practice? What's the remedy going to be? Sorry, you need to unmute yourself, Mathilde. You need to unmute yourself. I think. Okay, it's okay. Okay, good. 
Yeah, in, in the total case, the originality, no, it's not an originality now because I think it's, a, it's exactly the same, of, it was exactly the same for, for the, the shell case. The goal of the plaintiffs is not to obtain damages, but to obtain some injunction. And I think it, it is, the, 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 it will be maybe for the judge, the big problem also. Uh, to 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 appreciate the kind of injunction that he could give, for instance, uh, the plaintiffs um, demand to request uh, that uh, total stop or, or reduce the the emissions, and it won't be easy for the judge to appreciate this kind of remedies and. Above all, there is a word in the law which could be difficult to appreciate. It's the word reasonable, because the remedies which are requested are only reasonable measures. And it could be the key, the key element and the earth of the debate before the judge of Paris. What are exactly today reasonable measures? So I think that will be the, the most important difficulty to prove and to obtain some reasonable measures from the judge. I don't know really today, I don't know what could be a reasonable measures. Maybe it will be a mix between the different interest, economic interest, social interest, not to stop all the activities, but to find uh, a more conciliating interest decision. Thank you very much. Uh, Yap, would you like to uh, say something on, on remedies? remedies? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, first, uh, claims for damages, if successful, are helpful to the victims uh, that have initiated the case. They are of no avail whatsoever for the world, the environment, uh, and so on. Uh, secondly, far-reaching liability uh, is perverse. It would mean the first reap all. We have lost the mess, and now we are uh, collecting the funds available. Nothing will be left for the next generations. And for practical purposes, very little, if anything, will be available for the most vulnerable victims. So with exceptions, I do not think that damages is a promising way ahead. We really should focus on what matters mo most, i.e. to prevent a global mess. That being said, I realize that successful claims for damages may bring people to their senses, but it runs the risk of uh, doing more harm than good. Uh, uh, Joanna, uh, any, any thoughts on this uh, kind of global level? Uh, are we trends from the trends you gave us? Are we seeing? more claims for damages, less claims for damages, any geographical basis? Yeah. For that? So um, we started uh, in the kind of the first wave of climate litigation. We usually talk about the first wave uh, kind of until 2015 with a number of these compensation damages cases in the US following the precedents and uh, uh, the strategies of the tobacco litigation, in, including many of the lawyers who were involved in the climate cases were lawyers that had been working on the tobacco and the asbestos litigation. That Those cases didn't succeed. And uh, now we see um, a, a, a whole new wave of these types of cases seeking compensation, most of them in the US. So that is still something that we, that is ongoing. Um, of course, these cases are different from the first wave, and, and there are several reasons why they're different, but 
Um, anyway, they're, they're, they're ongoing. They have a, perhaps a better chance of winning, but still a very slight, slim uh, chance. Uh, so I agree with what Yak was saying in terms of if I would file my own case, I would be thinking of the future rather than uh, looking into the past. Uh, whereas at the same time, I understand that the, the cases that look at past emissions and, and the damages are current and future, they, they have their role. Um, their role, I find, is primarily a, a role of reputational damage, to be honest. I think that these cases, they, they, they are cases that have, uh, they are quite effective in the messaging. They are quite effective in how they tell a story of what climate change is what caused the problem, who is going to suffer. And not, I think the best case for that is Liuya, of course, you know, the Peruvian farmer in the, in the Andes who is suffering from what RWE did in decades. That's the messaging that this case is bring, these cases bring so powerfully, or the cities and the states in the US. They, they tell a story about what we are experiencing and will experience in a very, uh, powerful way. But in terms of what we want to see happening, we want to see the future cases. We want to see the Total and the Shell case, making Total, Shell, and many others change their behavior, change the way they do business from today into the future. Even if the, the other cases are adding that fear, adding that, okay, maybe we should be doing something because otherwise we'll have to pay what matters really is about their look into changing their core business in a way that is consistent to the changes that are needed. Very helpful, thank you. I suppose just to add one thing of my own on that, um, I suppose in terms of changing corporate behaviour, um, the, the, the threat of exposure to huge damages could possibly have some indirect effect there, couldn't it, through uh, insurers uh, shareholders, uh, investors in companies who will be impacted by those damages, maybe bringing commercial pressure to bear for uh, for different different behaviour. Uh, that that may be one one further angle on it. But um, I wanted to move on. We're, we've got a time for a couple more um, topics. I think um, the question really of um, I think jurisdiction uh, and, and forum and what goes what goes with with that. Again, Jan alluded to that, and I think said that maybe. Uh, Shell had uh, made a strategic mistake in, in not contesting the jurisdiction of the um, uh, the Hague uh, court, but it does it does seem to me that a lot does turn on where these cases are brought, uh, the law it's under, the attitude of the court, the the approach to costs and so on within the court. Um, someone raised the fundamental point along with that is how are these cases funded? Um, uh, is it by NGOs? Uh, is it by a lawyer? Obviously, if, if there's a lot of damages at stake, then lawyers may be very interested in, in supporting them uh, for um, conditional fees and so on. But um, uh, how, are they, how are they funded? And then, of course, uh, you've got the issue, you get your judgment in a particular jurisdiction. Um, depending on the relief then, you know, how is that going to be, be enforced against a company which isn't actually in that in that jurisdiction. So that's obviously an extremely big, big topic, um, uh, raising issues of um, private international law, but it does seem to me for the future of all this, uh, a very important one. Um, so I'd, I'd welcome any thoughts you have on that. Maybe um, maybe I'll ask Yap to, to come in first on that, if he's willing to say something on it. Well, these are extremely important and terribly difficult questions. Um, as to the enforceability, I may be mistaken, uh, time will tell, but my guess is that even if judgment is not enforceable, major enterprises will be reluctant to ignore it because it will majorly damage their reputation. Um, but uh, well, many multinational enterprises have subsidiaries around the globe. So to some extent, enforceability may not be that difficult. 
although only in part, I realize. Um, but the but this highlights the utmost importance of a debate about global obligations. Otherwise, we will have litigation before many, many courts about the globe, around the globe. The outcome is unpredictable. The cost will be enormous, and that's a waste of money. That money can be much more useful, usefully invested in measures to reduce emissions uh, and to reduce the emissions of products and services. Um, uh, one final point. Assume that we will have litigation before multiple courts. And assume that that will be based on the law of the land, so to speak. And that, which is not obvious, the interests of the land will be decisive. Well, what will happen if a case is going to be submitted to a court of the small island states, their interest is that we will have to reduce emissions almost overnight. They may not care about the consequences because, well, they are doomed to disappear anyway. Uh, we don't need that kind of developments. We really must start creatively and swiftly how we can together solve this problem. And that means to me, at, among many other issues, a debate on global obligations. Thanks very much. I, that, that makes a huge amount of sense to me, uh, Yap, I must say. Uh, Mathilde or Jana, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, I don't know if we, if we have enough time just to, to add that uh, maybe this is a good point also of uh, our system in, in French law. Uh, we have a very flexible uh, conception of uh, the separation of the powers. And that's why, for instance, already the administrative judge recognized his competence for condemn uh, the French state. It was not a problem for him because, of course, it just imposed to the state to do something, but it stays very, very flexible about the contents of uh, of uh, the um, the injunction, and maybe it could be the same uh, for the total case. Uh, above all, it will be uh, impossible for the judge because of the separation of the powers to cancel, for instance, an authorization uh, which is given by the states, the authorization to to just to have an activities and to, to pollute. It will be maybe the only problem about the separation of the powers because for um, for contest and uh, for uh, trying to um, to um, how can I say to, to cancel the law, uh, the the plaintiffs have. Uh, has to go before the administrative judge and not before the judiciary judge, uh, not because of the separation of the powers, but more because of uh, um, the separation of our two orders, administrative orders, the so judge administrative and the judiciary uh, order for judges. Look, uh, I'm aware of time, and I know we're already past the hour. Um, I, I, if I can just for the last time say uh, many of uh, these questions we are, are are excellent questions, and and we do answer to some of these in the new uh, 2022 Global Trends Reports that is being published tomorrow. So I hope you have a chance to to read and and um, you know uh, get in touch if you have any questions especially in person if you if you happen to come tomorrow. But um, yeah, I, I don't want to hold us uh, for too long past the hour, just thanking everyone. And maybe, Stephen, you want to um, put a, a, an end to this uh, really interesting conversation we just had. 
yes, I think we, we should we should respect the timing and, and stop there. So I'm very grateful to all three of you for, um, first of all, your excellent presentations and uh, doing them within 15 minutes, which is very difficult, and also the way you've answered the questions. Um, uh, I haven't managed to pick up quite all the questions that came up in the Q&A, but I think most of them, maybe the speakers will be able to, um, if, they're, if they're able to address one or two of them um, online. Uh, but um, I've certainly found this a fascinating hour and a half, I hope. If you've been listening, you have to, and that the slight problems we've had with sound haven't detracted too much uh, from your, your enjoyment of it. Uh, so thank you again to Bickle and to Ivano for organising this. Uh, I hope we'll be able to come back and revisit this topic again uh, sometime in future and see how things are developing. But um, with that, uh, I will thank the speakers. Uh, I, I'll just, uh, there are various Bickle events coming up. I think there's a the annual WTO conference on climate change. Uh, you, you want to keep an eye on the Bickle uh, website, I'm sure, to see other things which will be of great interest to you. So um, thank you all again. Um, thank you for joining us and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye.